Okay. Um, so I promised the last time where I to tell you a little bit about Twitter. So, um, oh, I'm in the right place. How did that happen? Let me go back here. Okay, uh, so how Twitter uses big data. And then we'll talk a bit more about the topic of the lab. Um, so what I present to you is based on some slides from 2013 by the lead architect of Twitter. Um, so the slides are maybe a little bit out of date, but um, I haven't found anything as concrete in terms of details as the talk. And a lot of the concepts in it are, are still very interesting and relevant. So he gave a talk called Twitter Timelines at Scale, talking about how they managed to scale Twitter uh, around that time. So what is a timeline in Twitter? For those of you who don't know Twitter, this is maybe an, an older view of Twitter, but essentially you log in as a user and you get a list of the tweets of people you follow um, and tweets that might be of interest to you. So essentially it's, you know, somehow you're subscribed to all of these tweeters and it gives you all the tweets for those subs subscriptions in your timeline. So in terms of Twitter, we can imagine that they receive a lot of data that they have to process. So they have at this time in, in 2013, at the time of the presentation, 150 million active worldwide users. I think that was, you know, having tweeted in the last 30 days or somehow had some activity in the last 30 days. 400 million tweets written per day. Uh, this is a mean of 4,600 tweets per second or an, a max of 150,000 tweets per second. So if there's some big event like uh, the Super Bowl or a concert or um, some something that's talked a lot about, let's say in the Super Bowl, someone scores a touchdown or in a football game, someone scores a goal, um, a lot of tweets can be sent all at once. So it's very peaky, right? Um, there's 300,000 queries per second for timelines. So essentially there's a lot of people just refreshing their timelines looking for, for the latest tweets. So um, a lot of requests for timelines. And then they have about 6,000 queries per second for custom search. This is sort of like keyword search or looking for uh, tweets with certain tags, this, these sorts of searches. Um, so looking at this, if I'm working in Twitter, I have to think which, which aspect here is most important to optimize, right? Um, and if I look at the numbers, okay, we have 4,600 tweets on average written per second. Okay, it can be peaky. We can have large peaks um, in the amounts of tweets written, but we have many, many more um, requests on average for timelines. So it seems like this is probably what we need to optimize. And we have relatively few custom searches compared to timelines. So this somehow seems to be, you know, we have almost two orders of magnitude, almost a hundred times more uh, requests for timelines than tweets actually sent. So we really need to optimize for, for this thing here. This is a lot of the requests that we have. They're not right requests, but rather just get my timeline, please. So this is probably the most important to optimize. Um, so, okay, how this works, keeping that in mind is kind of counterintuitive. Um, so we have various um, uh, components here in the Twitter component and someone sends an API, right? Uh, someone sends a tweet to the API through the application. And then this goes into what's called a fan app component. And what that will do is it will write that tweet instead of writing it once, for a given user, like, okay, if I send a tweet rather than write it once, you know, Aiden has sent this tweet in the Aiden part of the database, it writes it to all of my followers' timelines. So if there's five people following me, it will write that tweet into their timelines directly. If there's 500 people following me, then it will write the tweet into the 500 places. So it duplicates the information about the tweet into all the timelines of the people who follow me which is very counterintuitive because in relational databases, we try to avoid redundancy because it's hard to keep things up to date and, and blah, blah, blah. But here it's the opposite, right? We're going to write it into essentially everyone who could be interested in that tweet, we write it into their, their timeline. And what is Redis here? Redis is um, an in-memory key value, no SQL storage. It's basically a very simple, very scalable 
database. Uh, we'll talk more about this later in the course. So we ha also have here a social graph service, which tells us who is following whom. So if I send a tweet, we need information about who is following me to know into which timelines we need to write that tweet. Okay. So in general, um, this then is what a timeline would look like. A timeline would contain the IDs of the tweets, the IDs of the users that sent the tweet, some bits, like is this a retweet? It contains some sort of flags to give some metadata about the tweets. Is this a retweet? Uh, maybe when it was sent and so forth. And the tweet ID in case it was a, a retweet or a reply or something like that. So this is what the, the timeline of one user looks like. So it's a list of tweet IDs, user IDs, and some, some metadata about the tweets. Okay. So if we think about it, some users have millions of followers. So if Lady Gaga, for example, okay, these are from 2013, but if Lady Gaga tweets a picture of her breakfast, um, then Twitter has to try to somehow write uh, that tweet into 31 million places in its database to 31 million different timelines. So this can cause some lag and some issue. It's not, you know, not everyone is going to be able to receive the Lady Gaga tweet at the same time. And maybe sometimes you might have seen on Twitter um, a retweet of a tweet. And then later you saw the tweet, you know, you get this inconsistent timing, but eventually it will become consistent. We'll also talk about this later in the course. Um, so then when we read, what's the benefit of this? Why would we ever write the same tweet 20, 30 million times uh, or whatever? So in general, the idea is that when we go to read, the timeline is ready. We don't have to do anything. We just have to go in and we just have to get the timeline and we're done. Okay, And then we need to somehow enrich some of the information. So that's essentially what these components do here. When we read, we read from the database. We read the timeline of the user. We enrich it using these services, which give us information about the users and give us more information about the, the tweet or somehow we use, use these data here to enrich the tweets to get the, the final thing you see. And this is very efficient because we don't have to do anything, just one look up into our database. And in general, in the median case, 50th percentile, they can do this in one millisecond, 99th percentile and 99% of the cases within four milliseconds. So very counterintuitive, very different to what you would do in a relational database, but this is what works for, for Twitter. And supporting text search, um, they use something called Early Bird, which is a sort of a clone of a tool called Lucene. Uh, so in this case, what they will do is only write the tweet once, um, and then it will have to be queried many times. So instead of trying to write every tweet under every keyword, uh, it's just indexed once in an inverted index. And we'll, we'll also talk a little bit more about this later, how this works, uh, this in, information retrieval and inverted indexes at scale. So, okay, again, the ma major difference here is the numbers of requests. So on the right side, for just for tweets, there are 4,600 uh, requests per second to write a tweet. So essentially it has to be written many times into many different uh, timelines. And, uh, but when we go to read, we only need to read from one thing. Okay. Whereas in the custom search where we have the same number of tweets, but we have fewer custom searches per second, we only write once into one location. And then when we, when we go to read, we need to read from all the different locations where that tweet might, might have been indexed. So this is um, and why the difference here, why is it, you know, write many times, read once, because here we have so many requests, we need to optimize this. In this case, it makes more sense to just write once and read money. Um, okay, so the full architecture looks a bit like this um, for Twitter at that time. So we had this um, search index, which was for text. We'll discuss information retrieval techniques in the course. We have this NoSQL system here, uh, which is for a sort of a very simple scalable database. We'll also talk about NoSQL systems in the course. And we have this component here called Hadoop, which is for processing uh, tweets, for example, to find what are the trending tags. We need to be able to process lots of tweets in batch. Um, and 
will also be talking about these sorts of distributed processing frameworks in, in the course as well. So uh, what we won't be talking about are the, the mobile aspects or the front end, right? The, the sort of back end, uh, we're going to be talking about the different types of technologies and more modern versions of these technologies that have come along since that could be used uh, for these sorts of components. Um, so, you know, I haven't found any more recent data, but there's some some more information from 2017 where they're still suggesting they, they use a little bit of relational databases, they use still Hadoop, key value store, so that hasn't changed. They've changed maybe some of the distributed storage, which we'll talk about uh, later, and the rest are more related to, to front end. So this is somehow an idea of the technologies they're using. Um, any questions on that? Um, the sorry what does the number n present there i would have been it's you know this is um this was from the original presentation so but this n here would actually represent timelines and this n here would represent the number of locations somehow the number of indexes that are that are there for the number of different machines indexing different parts of the of the text of the indexes so the n here is more like many it's not a I don't think it was meant formally in the original presentation. So write many, read once, and uh, here write once, read many. But here specifically, number of timelines following the specific user who sent the tweet, and here the number of locations in which the indexes, the number of shards or machines indexing the indexing the text. Um, any other questions? Um, okay, so any doubts, questions? Is it weird? Is it weird that if you have 20,000 followers, it will, instead of writing it once under your name, write it into the timelines of the 20,000 followers? Um, I, it's counterintuitive at first, but if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, I, I guess. Um, I'm sure, of course, they also optimize for the for the users with very high numbers of followers i presume it's you know they, he doesn't give all, all the details in the in the talk but i presume that they have some tricks for very um, popular users um okay so if there's no questions or doubts um we can talk about the topic of the lab so what essentially we'll be doing is uh looking at um finding the most frequent words and phrases in all of Wikipedia. In, in the case of the lab, you'll have Spanish Wikipedia and it will just have the first paragraph. There will be no problem with processing all of Wikipedia, but it would be slower to download data and messier and it doesn't really, doesn't really matter that much. Um, so you'll have a million, the first paragraph and the title of a million articles in Wikipedia. Uh, and it's a, all in one document and you have to count or find the most frequent words and phrases uh, Spanish Wikipedia, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, so how would you do this? So you're going to do this locally on what your machine, on the machine that's in front of you now, or your notebook or whatever. Any ideas? Um, yeah, I, I would, well, naively, first and foremost, um, try to search, um, I mean, do, do, a a pass on every word on the, on the dictionary or, or I don't know, the JSON, something that we have. And, uh, from, from then um count the, the the appearances of each word and save them onto a dictionary or a maybe a hash map yep. to just count the, the appearances and then display them that's the naive approach that i think of perfect perfect yeah so you'd probably think of okay we're, we'll assume an input file just a plain text file with words and um K as an input. So we want to print the top 100, the top 10 most frequent words or phrases. Uh, so we'll just think about words for, for a second. So we could create a new map, a new dictionary uh, in, in Python. This is pseudocode, by the way. This is not a specific language. 
And for every word in the file, uh, we have something to parse the words from the file. Um, we will get the count of that word from the map that we created. If the count is null, so if we haven't seen that word before, we put a one for the word. Otherwise, we'll put the word with count plus one. Okay, uh, pretty straightforward. And then at the end, if we want to get the most frequent, we need something to, to sort somehow the entries in the map by value and we want it to be descending. So we have the, the highest values at the top. And then we just print that list from one to K, for example. Um, so any possible issues here? Now, I know there's, there, there might be ways to optimize this and so forth. Um, but aside from, you know, for example, maybe here there's ways instead of sorting the entire map to store a priority queue and its K values and so forth, but more, more general issues. Yeah, that is too many data. So you can't just work all of that in just a for loop. Yeah. You would need more threads or something like that. Uh, okay, multi-threading. You could do multi-threading, but you'll find that it probably won't help you that much um, because the, the cost, a lot of the cost here will be in just reading the file, um, depending on how you know efficient your process is, but you will probably be disk bound. And since you have to read the file from the disk anyways, um, there's not really so much you can do beyond that. Um, you know, you can try, you could try to do some threads, it might help, but um, yeah. So, but the, the, the first point is an important point, the amount of data that you have. Um, so the question is, where is this map going to be stored? It's going to be stored in memory, right? So eventually your, your map, you're going to run out of memory. You're going to run out of heap space or you're going to work, run out of memory for your program. Um, if this, this map gets too large and if it does get too large, it's not an easy problem to solve, right? So you can give all the memory you have, you can maybe buy more memory, I don't know, but um, there's no, there's no uh, interesting tricks there. Um, but there is one technique we can use, right? So um, in general, just to say that if you're counting words in memory, you could expect to be able to count the words by frequency uh, over very large documents in memory. And this is because of a law called Heap's law, which says essentially that, you know, here you have the length of the document, let's say. And here's the number of unique words you're going to find in that document. Or as you read into a large document, how many unique words you're going to find. And as you progress into the document at the start, you'll find lots and lots of unique words and then it will start to slowly um, trail off. And we see in general that the numbers of um, unique words are not you know, that much. For 200,000 words, we could expect roughly 4,000 unique words. Uh, of course, this depends on the number of, of proper nouns, names of things, the, the exact type of document it is. But, you know, the, the general idea is that the number of unique words will reduce over time as we read larger and larger documents. So we could expect to count words over very large corpora, maybe, hopefully. We'll see how that works. We'll see if, you know, if you have maybe two gigabytes on your notebook, you can see if you can count all of the words, individual words and on Wikipedia or not. We'll see that in the lab. Um, but if we move to phrases where we have phrases of two words or phrases of three words or four words, eventually it's not going to fit in memory. Okay? The phrases get larger and larger um, and there's more repetitions of words in the different phrases and so forth. So the space table will be larger. So if we were interested in, in counting phrases and phrases don't fit in memory, what could we do then? If it doesn't fit in memory, we really only have one choice. We could try to be clever and think of all sorts of different options, but really we have to use the disk uh, more, which means we have to write things to the disk. We have to write data uh, to the disk, not just read the original file, but create other files, intermediate data and so forth. Okay, so the next question is, could we use the same process could we use this, this program and just instead of storing this map in memory as would be done by default in Python or Java or whatever, um, could we just store that map on the disk? And would it work? Right. 
So somehow you just take the bits that are in memory, you just stick those bits on the disk and I say, okay, you know, this is what machines do when they do swapping as well, for example, they, they will try to use the disk as if it were main memory. Um, so, I mean, it'll work. You could implement something, the same thing on disk, right? There's no, they're both forms of storage. But <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> But it won't, <laughs> I can't talk, but it won't uh, work very well. So why won't it work very well? Um, because we have too many IOPS, like yeah. in the double operations. And um, yeah, we, we, we would need to do more operations for checking the map on disk. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's um, a lot of operations of a specific type. So it's not that there would be necessarily more operations, but we'll have a lot of what's called random accesses. So if you think about main memory, you think about RAM, and RAM stands for random access memory. It's very efficient for kind of jumping to different locations of the memory. But on the disk, there's a physical arm that has to move every time you want to jump to a different place and it takes around 10 milliseconds. So to move that arm to where you want it. So it takes about three hours to do 1 million seeks. So if you're counting a document with 1 million words, uh, maybe you have to do two or three seeks, you could be talking about nine hours. Now, oftentimes there will be caches and you maybe you'll be accessing one word many, many times and so forth. So it could be faster than that, but you see that essentially disks are not designed for, for doing lots and lots of seeks of jumping around the disk to different places. Um, you can do it, but it will just be very inefficient. And really doing 1 million seeks in memory, you know, would cost nothing, it would be done in uh, nanoseconds, mm, milliseconds, I guess. So, okay, for it, we have to use the disk, we can't fit stuff in memory, then the question is, could we use the disk, but try to avoid random access somehow. Um, any ideas? Okay, so what we've ruled out on the disk is this idea of a map where we, you know, the map is big and we get a word and we have to jump to some random point in the map to, to find out the count and then to update it if, if necessary. So we've kind of ruled out that idea. Um, we could do it, it would just be very slow. Even though it's, uh, you know, if we use a hash map, it would be O N for N, the number of words, um, it will be very slow on the disk. So what we could rather think about doing on the disk instead is to order the words to sort them. So we have a list of our words here, you know, there might be spaces between them rather than new lines, but I'm just going to put each word on a line here, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so this is our disk um, or input file. We're going to sort the entire list of words. And once we've sorted the list of words, we're going to group together occurrences of the same word. So that means that we can then just read this file once through and essentially keep track of the duplicates. So when we reach here, we have Puelo one and then we see the word changes. So we write Puelo one and then we have K1, K2, K3, and then we see that the word changes. So we just write K3 and we continue like that. So once we have the words ordered, super easy to count them. I'll put the count and then we could do another order to, to order by frequency, for example. So now the question is, how can we do the ordering? Okay, so this part here looks super easy, the, the count, I hope. I hope that makes sense. Uh, the difficult part is how do we do this step here and this step here between these two? How do we sort on disk? Because the easy thing would be we load it into some sort of list, array, structure, we call it sort on that, done, right? But we can't, we can't fit the data in memory, so we have to go about it a slightly different way. So what we're going to do, any, anyone any ideas for how to do it? 
Eh, podríamos ir tomando pedazos del, del archivo y e ir ordenándolo y después tomar la primera mitad o la segunda mitad y después como tratar de siempre tener el máximo de memoria RAM posible. Yep. Yep. Pero so, uh, ir haciéndolo de esa manera. Yep, yep. So the, the last part uh, would be a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, the idea would be to just store, store or sort batches, we would say, um, lotes in, in memory. Um, so what happens is we have our disk, this time we have phrases of, of length two. Um, so we have n phrases of uh, what we call bigrams because they have two words. So bigrams, trigrams, n-grams. So in this case, um, we have n bigrams. And we're going to just try to get as many of them, stuff as many of them into memory as possible. So we'll define a batch size b. Um, and we'll read in, in this case, we'll say b equals four. We'll read four things into memory at a time, sort them in memory. Yeah, so we see that they're being sorted in memory and being written to a, a intermediate file. Right? So we have these batch files and each batch is sorted. Um, so then the question is, how do we, how do we uh, merge these files? So each of these is sorted. So what we need to do is we have our memory again, and we just need to read the very first line of each file. And we remember in memory which file the line came from. So we have a CS, the la, and the la. So a CS is from file three, the la is from file one, and the la is from file two. And we know that the top line in all of the original file must be in here, right? Because it must be one of these top lines here. So we don't need to know anything more for the moment. So we see a CS is the first line. So we write that out. We see it's from file three. So we move the pointer to file three to the next line. And then we read the, the next line into, into memory. So the la three, okay. So now we read the la one. So we write the la one. We move the pointer, we get the la one again. Okay. And then uh, we move on again we get the la two. So we move the la two here to sido, or I think, what happened? Something went wrong. Ah, oh, see, okay, I think there's a problem with the animation. But anyways, so you get the idea, hopefully. So every time you take the top line, you move the pointer for that file to the next line, and then you just continue the process, okay? So SK is one, so we'll read from file one. We're gonna write SK here. We're going to move the pointer here. Uh, we're going to read port K, and we see that it's now the last line. Okay, so next we read, I see the two and so forth. So uh, we continue until we've reached the end of all the files and then we're done. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, so, so here we need to store um, N over B ceiling, so round it up um, because we have N over B batches. B is the size of each batch, N is the size of the original input file. So if we had batches of 1,000 and we had 5,500 lines, we would need six batches, for example. Um, and we would need to re remember the first line of each of the six. In the off chance that it wasn't possible to store this in memory, this was too big for memory, we could do something like, for example, merge half the files and then that will half we merge the other half of the file. So that generates two files and then we can merge those. So that would be called a multi-pass method. But essentially you would want to be um, doing working with some massive amount of data for, for that to be necessary. So you can always do a multi-pass if you wanted. Okay, and then once it's sorted, we have the count. So we can just uh, read this file like we said before and just output how many duplicates we find when we read the, the sorted file. Um, and if we want them by frequency, we can just sort this file again using the same process we saw. Just this time, we're going to be sorting based on this column here rather than the, uh, the phrases. If we wanted to scale further, then we need to talk about more machines. You know, what happens if it doesn't fit on the disk? What happens if our disk fills up? Well, in, in that case, you're, you're going to probably need multiple machines, a bigger machine, or you're going to need multiple machines, and that's the topic for, for next time. So that's sort of the, the overall topic of the lab. You'll be downloading Spanish Wikipedia using uh, in-memory methods to count, using the disk to count. 
Uh, by the way, which do you think would be faster? Do you think it would be faster to count in memory or to count on disk using the methods we saw? So in memory with a map or a dictionary, or would it be faster on disk with sorts and so forth? Um, yeah, so, so the, the memory would be, um, would be much faster, how much faster you'll see. So you'll get some idea of, you know, can you count the words? How many words can you count? How much memory do you need? How long does it take in memory? How long does it take on disk? And that's to get an idea, roughly the objective of the lab is to get an idea of what one machine can do um, and how, how much data you can store in certain amounts of memory and, and how, you know, the trade-offs between the disk and the memory. So the memory should be faster, the disk should be more scalable. Probably, yeah. So it's a you can see you can see if it's a hundred thousand times faster in the lab. Um, okay, so uh, for the lab, if there's any questions, uh, just to mention that I know I've been talking for a while. Uh, this is not going to be. This is kind of a special case. Um, most of the labs, uh, I, if, if they're in some cases, I can finish the class in an hour. In other cases, it'll be 15, 10 to fifteen minutes at the start of the lab, rather than half an hour. Um, so if there's no doubts, we can pass on to the lab. That's your questions. Okay, so to pass on to the lab, we'll just enter into the Discord. If you don't know about the Discord, just uh, check the, um, the forum and you'll see some instructions on how to join the Discord. Um, so yeah, see you there. I'll leave this open just in case anyone has questions, but I'll just be muted and um, and without video. So if you have doubts or questions,